pleased to welcome Rachel Wiley. And Rachel Wiley, um, I heard her read at um, I heard her read at the Dodge Festival and was so impressed with her reading. I thought I have to have her come and read. And then she pointed out today that she came to my class at Binghamton with one of my graduate students and that she wrote a poem. And I remembered it was a wonderful poem, but I had completely forgotten that it was <laughs> Rachel who was in my class. So she had to tell me today that she was the, she had come to the class with Tara Betts. Uh, Rachel Wiley's first full-length collection of poems, Fat Girl Finishing School, was recently published by Timber Mouse Press. A native of Columbus, Ohio, she has a degree in theater studies and has competed in much, multiple national poetry slam competitions. She was a finalist twice in 2011. Wiley has also toured nationally at slam venues, colleges, and festivals, and most recently, she had the honor of being part of the Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival in Newark, New Jersey. She is on staff at Writing Wrongs Poetry Slam, where she occasionally gets to host the night. Her work has been featured by the Huffington Post, Everyday Feminism, Frig Magazine, Drunken Boat, and Nailed Magazine. And she was profiled along several other women writers in Hooligan Magazine. Rachel Wiley is not a hooligan, but a brave <laughs> woman and a wonderful poet. Let's welcome. When we were kings one day. When my niece is four years old, she stands on her chair in a Wendy's to give me lessons on how to roar like a lion. She pulls the sound up from her feet, gnashes her teeth, a smear of ketchup or gazelle's blood at the corner of her mouth, tells me girls can be kings too. She's making her fiercest lion face when a man walks up and tells her to smile that she is too pretty to have her face screwed up like that. Before I can tell this man that my niece's face is not for his concern, she has obliged him, though the lion was still twitching prey, clamped in her jaws, she locks eyes with him and growls until he walks away. Now my niece is six, tallest girl in her class, but stoops from being told to make herself smaller so as not to be intimidating, smiles mouth closed to hide missing teeth so as not to show imperfection, swallows the right answer in class so as not to look so smart, skips pizza day because she's all of the sudden worried if she's thin enough to be a queen or just pretty enough to be someone's trophy. She's being tamed for the poachers and I am undone. I see you, patriarchy. You gas leak, you pickpocket, you wasp's nest in the attic, you virus of glass, you hothouse minefield. I see the two short years it took you to hollow her defiance into something ungainly. The way you make her fear taking up space by spiking words like fat and loud and bossy. The way you render her invisible for not matching your standard of what is beautiful. The way she is taught to wait for a prince to save her because their violence is acceptable violence, because boys will be boys and girls will be property. I have already spent too much of my own reign, a circus act of obedience with your head too close to my teeth. You will not have her too. She will not count calories at 10 or rest her worth on how many boys ask her to the dance. This is the notice of your dismantling. I will split the bellies of men who have plundered us for our growl. 
build stilts out of the femurs of men who expect us to shrink for them, and stack crowns worthy of girl kings out of the teeth of men who tell women to smile. We are coming for what is ours, and we will be kings again one day. on the tea train in Boston, or it is now. This is just to say after William Carlos Williams. This is just to say I have eaten the beauty standards that were in the icebox and which you were probably clinging to for profit. <laughs> Forgive me, they were fucking ridiculous, so binding, and so cold. <laughs> For Nicholas, who's so concerned, um, and Nicholas is a, a man that wrote me once after a show uh, telling me that um, there's no possible way that a fat woman can be beautiful and confident. Um, <laughs> and so, and he framed all of this um, around some concern for my health, which he can't possibly know not being my physician. So um, I wrote this for him, and I went back to Cincinnati where the show was and performed it to his face. <laughs> so I'm not talking bad behind anybody's back. He already knows what the deal is. The band was in full swing the night we met. My beautiful, all cotton pressed and petticoat full. You led me from the dance floor, concern bruising the top of my arm to remind me in an embarrassed whisper that I am much too fat. And making a fool of myself with all of this skin that I wear, all of this immodest self-love, all of this space I am taking and still taking. I mean, my God. People are watching. Don't I know that I am dying? Don't I know that I am a sugar-blooded elephant? Oh, Nicholas, forgive my clumsy audacity in forgetting to hate my tusks. I was so dangerously carefree. Who knows what could have happened? I might have incited a herd of gray-fleshed wallflowers to shake the chandeliers down to the floor with the sound of skin smack and hip sway and unapologetic buoyancy. Thank goodness you were there to lead me home. Your insecurities finding my wayward trunk. I am obviously a large and simple girl, stumbled into feeling all too human with the air kissing at my unsightly skin. Like I never felt laughter slinky walk my spine. Or deep kiss pavement at the sound of an insult backfired from a passing car or felt every single knuckle in a punchline you would think I'd have learned by now. But this body and its fault lines, they don't belong to me. My fact is a crime scene for other people's concern. It seems I will swallow everything. So why not your good intention too? A little known fact about elephants and rooms. Everyone sees the elephant standing there. They all think they're the first to point her out, the first to tell her that she is an elephant. The elephant is very aware she's an elephant. By nature, she cannot forget this. The room would never allow her to forget this, so she may as well dance. Take your bullhook hands off of me. I am no one's broken beast, and I've got whole houses to shake down into clapboard and brick dust. Mm -hmm. 
This is called Purple Hearts. The night my 87-year-old great-grandmother died, she was coming home from a date. <laughs> but wet pavement and impractical shoes, a broken hip, a body in shock, a passing. The first time I ever heard the word slut, it kettle steam slipped from between the plastic pearl veneers of my Aunt Dolores as a procession of antique soldiers in their dressiest blues from the VFW, where my great-grandmother gave out warm plates and warmer hands to troops of empty-housed men filed one after another, dropping the contents of their left breast pockets into the box where my grandmother lay, beautiful in far too much rouge, delicate, like some ancient corsage. And I decided, right then, that someday, I want to be a slut, just like grandma and be sent up to glory on a parade of grateful, unlonely hearts. This is called Purple Hearts. The night my 87-year-old great-grandmother died, she was coming home from a date. <laughs> but wet pavement and impractical shoes, a broken hip, a body in shock, a past. The first time I ever heard the word slut, it kettle steam slipped from between the plastic pearl veneers of my Aunt Dolores as a procession of antique soldiers in their dressiest blues from the VFW, where my great-grandmother gave out warm plates and warmer hands to troops of empty-housed men filed one after another, dropping the contents of their left breast pockets into the box where my grandmother lay, beautiful in far too much rouge, delicate like some ancient corsage. And I decided right then that someday I want to be a slut just like grandma and be sent up to glory on a parade of grateful, unlonely hearts. <laughs> I do a lot of work about the body, about uh, being proud of my body, but it wasn't always that way. Um, and so this next piece um, is sort of part of that early journey um, to, bo to body love. It's called For Fat Girls, who considered starvation when bulimia wasn't enough. <laughs> Mom said that my teeth were perfect. Perfect brother had just gotten braces on his top four front teeth, a tiny railroad bridge connecting nothing. And my mom said my teeth were perfect. At last, my quiet mouth, the swallow feelings, the overlook had all paid off and cultured something perfect. And mine, my mouth is a music box stuffed with pearls. Perfect brother is tall and lean, eats whatever he wants. One time, a whole box of oatmeal cream pies but it is more clear each day that my baby fat is no longer baby fat, but just fat, fat. It is clear I will not be a ballerina. I had wanted to be a ballerina. My mouth is a music box. A small girl spins gracefully at the back of my throat on point. I am sure if I can just reach far back enough I can still have her legs. I reach for her every night after dinner while the bathtub fills. One day, the health teacher shows us a photo of a mouth full of broken dishes. 
said the side effects of bulimia include ruined teeth. My perfect becomes a ransom I cannot bring myself to pay. I swallow the girl, and then nothing more for two whole days. My mouth is a music box playing a low grinding gear that puts me to sleep. When I do not wake up a spinning girl encircled in pink tulle, but rather a ravenous hollow encircled in outgrowth, I sneak down to the pantry, eat an entire box of oatmeal cream pies before heading upstairs and brushing my teeth one at a time. Paper babies. My boyfriend sends me a text that asks, when we have a daughter, can we name her Marble? It's not the name, but the when that pulls me to a record scratch stop. Two hours later, my roommate breaks up with his girlfriend because there was, quote, no point in stretching it out. He wants kids one day. She does not. Two nights later, there's an hour-long argument at a party, a bossy girl slamming her hands on the table after I say, I would have had my tubes tied yesterday if I could. She spits threats that I will change my mind. I don't know how to explain that I am not in denial, that while there is ache here, it is not her saying ache, it is not the ache of clock hands. Two weeks later, I am in the room when the strongest person I know and best friend of 15 years gives birth to her third child. She tells me how the contractions feel like a wolf attack from the inside out. Mm -hmm. By the end, there is so much blood, I am rifle loaded and looking for the beast that did this to her. It takes me nearly a month to hold the baby. When I finally do, I slip a finger into his mouth and feel around his soft gums for fangs. Two months later, my period is late. For the first time since losing my virginity, my boyfriend and I go to the pharmacy, buy a test. He makes a grand show of telling the cashier if it's a girl, we're going to name her Irma after his grandmother. I ration a little of the blood I am trying desperately to channel down to my uterus, up to my cheeks, and laugh for the first time the whole week. He holds me so miraculous that day that the minus sign almost feels like something was lost. They don't make Hallmark cards for your first pregnancy scare. There are no showers thrown for the moment you accept that you are much more wind drift feather than almighty motherly root. I promise this is a lonesome garden party never planned in haste. The guest list, a long gathered hope chest of flower pressed baby names left to decay in exchange for some different life. One where I can give in to simple whims without worry, or send postcards to my grandmother from all the places she never got to go, or curl up in the selfish abandon my own mother shouted from behind locked doors for. I do like children, but I own and like owning breakable things. I am and like being the one who breaks them. I do name each piece, though. Magda, Zora, Finn, Jack, Iris, Ada. There is this knowledge that he and I would make beautiful babies, Winston. He would make a great father, Florence. I would, despite my protests, make a really good mother, Oliver. There are pregnancy dreams, Ella. They're holding hands to belly and wondering what an answer might feel like. 
horror. There is sadness in knowing I will not be that piece of miraculous for him or with him. There is a strange and unexplainable guilt for wanting none of this. There is ache here. This I have named marble. where the trainer repeatedly struck her with the bull book. The circus fat lady eulogizes Mary the Elephant. They've gone and made you a ghastly ornament of uncontrol, Mary. Your pain overturning a whole city atop the man who dare handle you like some Dumb creature. Your largesse, both your attraction and your charge. Isn't it something? The way these small souled people toss their hard earned nickels at our feet to marvel in our vastness, to be in the presence of our dangerous, to mock their fear and our content, to provoke our great mass into motion so they can crown themselves then movers of mountains worshiping and damning us in one breath for the wonders that we are. The message is clear. If you cannot be small, at least make it easy to handle you. Your anger, Mary, our anger, Mary. It reminds them of all the ways we can undo them with half the effort. How dare you want for the gentleness reserved for pretty little things. How dare you be so beastly when they only meant to beat you grateful and look. They've gone all drunk on bad justice, hauled you into the sky a thundercloud, named themselves the gods of your demise, robbed your gravestone face with hacksaws for all the trouble of your unrest. How quickly they forget the monumental hearts that drive these monstrous bodies. It took an entire mob and a railroad crane to give them their pound of flesh, and still you gave them tons. Mary, you are survived by all things large and wild-hearted and irreproachable. I survive you, Mary. I survive you, Mary. I survive you in every beastly enchantment I can muster. Okay. Um, when I first started reading poetry out um, at open mics, I got a sort of reputation uh, for writing what my friend would call you ain't shit poems. Uh, I wrote a lot of stuff telling people about themselves. Um, because 
I tend not to do that <laughs> as much in real life. Um, so poetry seems to be a safe way for me to not get in the bar fights. <laughs> um, and then I got dumped this past summer, last summer, um, and I kind of reverted to my old ways. This is called Dry Cake Wishes and Tap Water Dreams. On the birthday of the ex-boyfriend who told me I was too intense, I wish him a lifetime swaddled in beige. Skinless chicken boiled. Kraft singles, steamed rice, unflavored oatmeal, polo shirts tucked in. <laughs> I wish him sex, but only ever in the bedroom, always with lights out and socks on and planned in advance. I wish him Indiana, safety scissors, and mayonnaise. I wish him not exactly love, but a light that could be mistaken for love on a slightly overcast day. I wish him slightly overcast days, lukewarm showers. Saltine crackers, a prefab house in the suburbs painted in colors that resemble unflavored oatmeal, skim milk, unsalted butter, one ply toilet paper. I wish him the music of Mumford and Sons, a minivan, a commute to work in colors that resemble unflavored oatmeal to a job that requires him to wear polo shirts. Tucked in. <laughs> a windowless office, plain Cheerios, never honey nut, turkey bacon, which is neither as good as turkey nor bacon. <laughs> I wish him crustless white bread sandwiches so he may never know that the bread saw the joyful heat of an oven. I wish him great clips haircuts. I wish him engagement photos in an apple orchard. A wedding in a strip mall chapel wearing his very best polo shirt. <laughs> Tucked in. A wife that wears headbands and uncomfortable silence. Half hearted, lubeless hand jobs and a pair of dress socks for every anniversary. I wish him a golden retriever that pees in the exact same spot on the carpet, not every day, but just often enough that he forgets and steps in it in soft feet on a Wednesday. I wish him a week of Wednesdays and half-mast erections and endless conversations that never quite break the precipice of small talk. I wish him a lifetime of safety and platitudes, a soundtrack of fluorescent lights humming, I do not wish him me again. Oh, never me again. I do wish him all of the children he said he was not sure he wanted, including and especially a daughter whose eyes remind him far too much of mine. <laughs> usually are always somebody who is heartbroken and um, blaming themselves for said heartbreak. Um, this is from another breakup I don't do that. Um, <laughs> it's called In Which the Poet Learns to Wake Up Alone. If you insist on dwelling in this notion that your love did go away, because they could no longer endure the heft of you. I say then, let them go. You may mourn them and all of the things dreamt but left unplucked between you. You may cry and rock and drink and fuck some stranger every time you forget, or better still, every time you remember the way their hands pulled at you without regret or judgment or fear, the way they perhaps coaxed from you some luxurious bravery to look yourself full naked in the mirror 
and smile at the heart it contained and the lust it released and all of the wild, unabashed melting of your body into theirs. You may mourn all of this, but you may not now. You may not ever stare contemptuous into your soft hips, your rounded stomach, all of your heavy and uneven parts as though they are a collection of children who simply would not behave well enough to make your love stay. You may not punish your skin with untouching. There should be no mournful candle lighting, no forgiveness ritual as your hips are not some obstacle to overcome. Your rippled and stretched skin are not an off-key choir to be endured. Take note from your thighs and the way they embrace one another like unshamed world in this, like unshamed love in this world so scared of touching. You, you hold so much warm that you must only be a holiday. And there is no penance, none whatsoever to be paid for.